In a previous lecture, we focused on ultimately the channels or types of channel intermediaries. We discussed specifically wholesalers, uh, both merchant wholesalers as well as agents and brokers, and we also discussed retailers. Now, there are several different types of retailers that I did review briefly in the prior lecture. Over the course of the next five to ten minutes, we're going to focus on discussing those a little more specifically, and so you can see the differences between them, of course. Now, generally, we group retailers into two categories. We have either non-store retailers or we have what we call store retailers. And there are a couple of differences as well as similarities in those particular groups. So let's go ahead and outline some of them. We'll start with store retailers. And we'll have non-store retailers over here. Okay, so store retailers, obviously they have a physical presence, uh, which is one of the different characteristics between them as well as non-store retailers. Non-store retailers don't have necessarily a physical presence, a bricks and mortar location commonly referred to as. Uh, and so ultimately we can do a couple of different things here with regards to not or store retailing. The first strategy that we may utilize in distribution with specifically store retailing is what we refer to as an intensive distribution or an intensive distribution strategy if you will. And with intensive distribution we are trying to place our products in as many stores as possible. And the goal with intensive distribution is really to ultimately get our products on the shelves of as many stores as we possibly can. We're not trying to limit ourselves uh, and be selective with certain retailers. And so you might ask, well, in what circumstances would you really want to have an intensive distribution strategy? And you, if you look at a lot of retailers, once you get up to the cash register area, there's a lot of low cost items that are considered to be convenience goods. And that's generally where you would utilize an intensive strategy is generally for convenience type goods because you don't necessarily need to be selective about specific retailers only carrying specific types of chewing gum or specific types of candy bars if you will uh, because ultimately these are very low cost items in terms of the consumer buying process we don't go through this really long process of deciding whether or not it's in our best interest to purchase them. We usually do it with little regard for the consumer buying process, with little regard for evaluation in general, because the items are low cost. So if it's not good, I simply won't purchase the next time and I'm only out one to two dollars. It's not that big of a deal. And so if you were a low cost convenience type item, you would go through the intensive distribution strategy because you're going to try to get on the shelves of as many retailers as possible because ultimately your sales are going to be somewhat linked to ultimately what your uh, kind of presence is in different stores. Now you can also utilize a selective distribution strategy. And the selective distribution strategy is just like it sounds. Uh, as opposed to using many stores, we're generally speaking going to use a few retailers. And usually the reason we want to use a few retailers is because we generally want there to be a certain perception about our particular products. Now the selective distribution strategy is ideal for mid to high priced products. Uh, you generally wouldn't use a selective distribution strategy for low priced items. Uh, and the reason is, is pr placing these types of products on every corner can hurt the brand of the company. You know, you really want to be associated with certain retailers because they carry a certain image associated with them. And if your products now are on every corner, you're diluting your brand, you're hurting ultimately the perception of your company because it's so easily accessible and readily available. But if I control the amount of retailers I work with, I now become more selective and inherently maybe more important, at least the perception would be. Now, even more selective than that, we get into a exclusive distribution strategy. In an exclusive distribution strategy, we are focusing on selling our products with generally just one retailer in a given area. 
And so you might ask, well, why does it make sense to sell with one retailer? You're limiting yourself. But the reason is, in this case, you want to limit yourself. If you could purchase something like Tiffany's Jewelry in any retail shops and Targets and Kmarts and Walmarts, Sears, everywhere, would it have the same value? Would we think about it in the same way? And truthfully, we wouldn't because it's easily accessible. Right? If diamonds were easy to obtain and if everybody had them, would they be as valuable as we feel they are? And so with utilizing an exclusive distribution strategy and only partnering with one retailer in a given area, in a given geographic area, we are, exclu- we are enhancing the perceived value of the good because it's not easily attainable. And for some products, you don't want them to be easily attainable because that hurts the perception of your product. And so in this case, obviously with Tiffany's, they have their own stores that they sell them out of. They have the very popular kind of light blue boxes that are very viewed synonymously with that actual company. And so all of those elements come together to say something about the particular products. Because they're exclusive, we view them as high quality, we view them as a a significant item there. Uh, Contrary to if they were in every single store, then obviously we see them all the time It's not as beneficial for us. We don't have the same perceived value towards it. Now, going on to non-store retailing. Non-store retailing includes a couple of different areas, of course. Uh, First one is online retailing. Uh, Obviously, we're all familiar with online retailing. Very, very popular today. We've seen online sales just balloon over the last decade or so. And this specifically involves selling products over the internet, uh, which does present some challenges, of course, right? Not nearly the challenges before, uh, but still there are some consumers who would prefer to actually try the product out, right? To test it, if you will. Uh, And some consumers do that, and that's one of the issues that a lot of companies have found, like Walmarts and Best Buys, and that they are competing with this concept called showrooming, where people go to a Best Buy, they try the products out, and they order them online at a retailer like Overstock or Amazon or something similar. Uh, Because we generally want to have the ability to test the product, to see it, to feel it, to ultimately look at it, to gauge quality for ourselves. Outside of online, we can also utilize what we call direct response retailing. And direct response retailing typically involves utilizing such things as uh, catalogs. You can also utilize like home shopping networks or infomercials more broadly. And so ultimately, you're not, there's not a physical store that you actually go to. Typically, it involves you see something you like and you place an order either, either over, over the internet or maybe over the phone. Maybe you mail in an actual order, although the days of doing that have definitely uh, passed for the most part. But you, in some circumstances, you still can actually mail in an actual order as well. Now, the other one, which is very, very common and very popular, is direct selling. Uh, Common direct sellers are using things like Pampered Chef as well as Mary Kay Cosmetics. And the idea is is that you sell products to consumers directly in their homes. And the uh, benefit, though, is that you typically have someone that you trust that's usually selling them, someone that you know. Uh, And so it's effective because you generally, you know, if you trust this person, we like to purchase products or goods from people that we actually do trust. And so having an in makes a lot more effective than if you had some stranger come to your home and try to sell you certain things because it's someone that you know or at least have, you know, some interaction with, you know, you usually are more inclined to maybe purchase something, maybe spend a little bit more. And the last component of non-store retailing is vending. And vending, of course, is selling products through vending machines. You know, we commonly see sodas, we commonly see snack foods that are sold via vending machines. There are some that even provide, uh, make coffee and cappuccinos and different things. Uh, but we've seen almost a resurgence in, in vending. You know, but before it was commonly used for drinks and snack foods, but now we've seen a, a transition to now you can purchase electronic goods in vending machines. You know, I was just in Chicago not too long ago and in the airport in Chicago O'Hare 
and at the hotel that I stayed, there were vending machines that when you can purchase MP3 players, you can purchase other different electronic goods, you can purchase headphones and a variety of other things. And so vending machines, obviously the benefit being is very low cost, right? Outside of simply purchasing the actual unit, you're not necessarily paying somebody to actually sell the products. You're not paying somebody's time, of course, and all those other different things. You know, it's typically items that people are already familiar with, right? And so I don't need to necessarily try out an iPod because I, I get the functioning of it. I understand what it does. Uh, and maybe they're a little more expensive there, uh, but at the same time, they're in convenient locations where I can purchase them without having to expend a lot of energy. And so from a distribution strategy, you know, vending machines can provide goods at locations that are certainly convenient, but also the last piece at the time that people want them, right? I might be in an airport and I need to purchase, you know, headphones and mine are damaged. You know, for some reason the cords got frayed. Now I can't hear anything and I'm in an airport. I don't have a whole lot of options. Well, there's a vending machine where I can purchase those from. And although I might pay a little more, the convenience of having the products available at a time that's convenient for me certainly adds a great deal of value. And so, what a lot of businesses do is they typically don't just resort to one or the other. You know, usually if you're a store retailer, you might use simply one because it's consistent with the perception you want to portray. But when using non-store retailing, you know, you might resort to a number of different areas. You might resort to online as well as maybe a direct response using catalogs and infomercials. And so you can utilize a number of different distribution methods for retail. But here's the thing you have to keep into consideration if they complement one another. And so you wouldn't necessarily use an exclusive retailer, right? And so if you're Tiffany's, you wouldn't be exclusive and work with only one retailer. But then you go ahead and you have vending as a non-store retailer. It wouldn't make sense uh, because you wouldn't want a product that is supposed to be perceived as so exclusive and so valuable to be purchased in something like a vending machine, right? The, the means of purchase don't make sense uh, because the, the vending process isn't complementary to the image we're trying to portray. So one thing that you have to consider is do the different methods of retailing, both store and non-store that we are using, do they complement one another? And ultimately, if they do, then maybe it's a good idea to pursue those.